Team back. Ten seconds remaining. Radiant team back. Hey ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Global Grandmasters presented by Moonduck, of course, as well as ProDota.eu. I'm Luminous and I'm joined by Android as we are the substitute casters for today. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending how you look at it, none of us are Moonduck yet, maybe. I don't know. I don't know what we're saying. This is Team Spirit versus Polarity. It's going to be your best of two and the draft is on the way. Android, what do you got for us? After that very, very solid introduction, which I have muted. Um, Android, I already introduced to you, but I muted Skype in doing so, so... They heard the introduction, <laughs> I just said you were awesome. Alright, well I am very excited to be here. Alright, Android, gonna be... are you here at all? Yes, can you... Off to a great start. Dire team pick. Life. Team All right, I'm gonna just keep talking until we get the the tech aspect in the background fixed. I do apologize about that. I think Skype has uh, dropped a call. Maybe. Android, are you back? I don't know. Nope. Android's not back. Okay, I'm gonna quickly log on Teamspeak and uh, make sure that we we have things going on there. The draft is as you are seeing it. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll just wait, wait and introduce the teams as I'm there. Hey, Android. Hello. <laughs> right. Okay, I already introduced you. Uh, I haven't introduced the teams yet, but uh, get in your words quick as this draft is already <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah, we are flying on through. This is going to be day number one of season one of the closed qualifier to get on in to the Global Grandmasters, a brand new tournament going to be bringing in some of the best teams in Europe to compete. There's going to be four uh, directly invited teams and four teams that grind their way up through these qualifiers and I'm very excited to see how Polarity is going to perform up against Team Spirit and it looks like, uh, yeah, this is going to be a best of two competing for points now to move on to move forward and starting things off, we've got some comfort heroes coming out for Team Spirit. You've got a life stealer picked up very very first, that's going to go the way of Havost. I've seen him play it uh, very recently in the Pro Dota Azubu Cup, and he basically builds it like this impenetrable wall where he goes for uh, Armlet into Sanj and Yasha into Heart, and it's absolutely enormous. We're going to see how Polarity deal with that. They pick up a Phoenix and a Slark. What else do they need to grind through this meat wall of the Life Stealer? Well, I think the better, best way to deal with that kind of lifesaver is perhaps to deal with his team. I mean, he at base, he's a melee hero, so you kind of kite him around with very mobile cores, such as the Slark. The Slark very good in, in long, drawn-out fights as well, so against a very tanky core like Lifesealer, you just keep taking stats away from him and, and deal with him there. I think the other concern here for Polarity's heroes right now is Team Spirit traditionally like to run very push-oriented lineups. They like their chance, they like their bears, which uh, Polarity has taken out. So my concern for that is, will Slark be the carry that you want against a pushing lineup? If you're knocking down your tier 3 towers at 15-20 minutes in, it's a Shadow Blade Slark or a Bling Dagger Slark the core you want in that scenario. So I, personally, I don't think that's the hero you want, but you know that, that might be the situation that, uh, that Team Polarity will be in. Yeah, I mean, Polarity right now are favored pretty heavily in terms of betting odds. It's just a little bit more of a cohesive team. All of these, Obviously, all these players are incredibly strong, and Team Spirit, they've been struggling just a little bit, and, you know, what do they have to pick up here to really get their synergy on point? Do they go for a push lineup? Do they go for sit-back-and-farm lineup? 
think the beauty of a Lifestealer and Beastmaster is that they could essentially do both. Beastmaster, an awesome ganker, an awesome pusher. In fact, he generally kills into a push uh, with his Necro Book and, and boars and whatnot. I think it's actually more important to make sure they have very stable supports to make sure they don't lose all their lanes. And also, critically, a mid laner that could be the vehicle for the Lifestealer. So I'm looking at Storms, I'm looking at Queen of Pains. Puck is taken out. Uh, you know, you can also pick up supports that could initiate, for example, like let's say a bounty hunter just walks in with an invis lifestealer uh, infested in him. So now they're going to pick up Enchantress, so that's most likely go, go back to the hero that's going to give them the push that they need. Um, a fairly decent hero in terms of shoring up all your lanes could really help the Beastmaster up top if that's a difficult lane, could gank mid or could pressure bottom. So I really, really like the, the Enchantress pick right now. Yeah, I think Enchantress is great. It's going to offer so much here. And once you get Enchantress with her, you know, Radiant big old creep army, you bring in Beastmaster with the Necros, with the Boar, the Hawk, you've got essentially a petting zoo ready to wail on the towers. Lightstealer is going to be super tanky, able to survive a lot of shots. So if Team Spirit get a window, they can push very, very quickly. And it looks like with the Spirit Breaker pickup, they're going to be looking for that window all around the map. They've got great jump, but Polarity with the Phoenix have ways to deal with that. Just go into the egg. Lifestealer can rip through the egg pretty easily, but the rest of the team may have to back off. I think this is like a very Hobos inspired draft. It's just like, it's <laughs> all the draft does is just run at you and they just run at you very hard. Spear Breaker, Life Stealer, maybe, maybe that is a vehicle I'm talking about, right? Where you infest into the Spear Breaker and you just go and you just get a ton of kills. You, you talked about the push and the push will come after the kills that happen. The, the concern for me right now, this Team Spirit draft is you don't have a hero that could go up the high ground. Sure, you could knock down all the out, outer towers and the tier two towers, but High ground is a very different beast. Uh, when you're kind of pushing up high ground, you're clumping for you know which doctor cask. The Phoenix Sunray is very good at defending it. You really want a range hero that could kind of just hit from far away and uh, make Team Polarity to commit to you. So I'm thinking of something like a Quaswex Invoke, not Quaswex, Exhort Invoker that could kind of just sit back and plink away with uh, Forge Spirits and whatnot. Yeah, Polarity absolutely. to me picks up a very strong answer now. You're looking at a lot of melee cores. Chronosphere will set up Witch Doctor as well as Phoenix Egg. You know, it's pretty good against what Team Spear's got going for them. Yeah, I mean, both uh, Iceberg and Undershock have a habit of playing Invoker. They're both very skilled at it. Iceberg, one of his trademark heroes, but I've seen Undershock put in some hours on that Invoker. It is going to get banned out now, so Team Spirit, they've got something else in mind, and they do deny that Invoker. What other mids can you pick up here? Do you go for something like a Quap to get that big spray damage? Um, Quap's going to be fairly decent. It's... I guess it's hard to actually say what's a good mid because you don't know what the other mid is. Um, I, I like Quap simply because she's going to be relatively tif uh, difficult to catch. With that said, though, the Nether the Nether Strike from Spear Breaker is very very good at dealing with Quap. So Mike's muted on stream. Yeah, I just realized so I muted. So all right, all of these technical difficulties are, are out of the way. Um, I guess the good thing is that uh, the game is not on the way yet. Uh, I feel a little bit silly here. Yeah, uh, you know what? It's day one of a very long tournament here. We are fill-in casters. We're just doing our best to bring you some amazing Dota here. Last pick for Polarity going in. They still need a mid unless we're going to see something crazy like a Void mid or a Phoenix mid, which I highly doubt. Um, I'm guessing we're going to see something more traditional. I'd put a couple of dollars there on the Quap. I think it offers a lot of team fight, plays very well into the Chronosphere, um, and we'll, we'll figure out what they're going to go for. I think if I could pick any Dota hero, like for example, if Puck is not banned, I think Puck is probably my pick for Team Spirit. Or sorry, for, for Polarity. They, they want something that's uh, not so difficult to uh, kind of initiate into. With that said, the Quap probably will be the pick, considering that they also need a little bit of damage. Because right now we're looking at Slark, pretty much it. Like Slark, that's your damage output. I, I think you need another core that could um, kind of give you the, the oomph. Phoenix could give you some, Witch Doctor could give you some, but. These aren't the hero that you count on for like the stable damage output. Yeah, I I think stable damage is going to be a big thing here because Faceless Void is so situational, Slark is so snowbally. They are going to go for uh, Iceberg Zeus, which is his third most played hero uh, in 6.78 and 8.8, obviously. Or rather, 6.87. There we go. Um, so he's had a lot of experience on this Zeus, and it's something you got to be scared of here. Aside from Lifestealer, everyone else is pretty squishy. Yeah, Zeus, you know, when you look at damage, like he's probably number one when it comes to massive damage output. And uh, 
especially against that Enchantress. I feel like Go Black's gonna have a tough time. Normally, you know, Chen is gonna be your mech buyer. Enchantress generally don't have the the, the gold, nor the mana pool to back up a mech. Uh, I wonder if he's actually gonna be rushing for a mech, or maybe just going for some just HP items. And without a mech, you, you're gonna have a very very tough time pushing into a Zeus. Uh, once he gets Aether Lens, he could just sit really far away, and uh, it's gonna be hard for Spare Breaker to charge in. Um, and I can go for kill, kill, so this makes a lot of sense for polarity. All right, now Spirit down to the last pick. Do they want to go full ultra aggro push and get a full petting zoo going? They could go, uh, you know, the Death Prophet's banned out against them, but they could go for another really high damage hero. Or do they want to sit back and play safe? The Dragonite's banned out, but there are other mids that can kind of sit back, play a little bit more controlled. I think Team Spirit might go all in. They are going to go for that quality after all. Now, Quap Zeus mid, there is so much kill potential. What do you think is going to happen there? I mean, Zeus, traditionally his weakness is the laning stage, and especially when there's a Spirit Breaker charging in. I imagine Quap is going to take advantage of that and just go for a lot of blink kills. I think it's actually more important on the side of uh, polarity. Like, Witch Doctor or Phoenix need to have a teleport scroll ready, or just probably just have one sitting relatively close to mid lane, whether it's stacking or checking runes. Just make sure that your Zeus doesn't get dove upon. I think Zeus is the actually the most important hero uh, in this particular draft. Like, his laning stage is the most important. Because you know the, the Slark's going to get relatively good farm. Uh, Void is... Now, Voice is going to get what he's going to get. Like, he's got an X Factor here, but Zeus is a lane that you could control and make sure he, he does well, and you need to do so because, again, I, can't, I said that they, they need some mid game damage, and Zeus is pretty much all of that damage right now. Absolutely. The damage spike is going to be pretty interesting to see here because Slark is so snowball-y. His laning phase is going to mean everything. Can he get early kills? Can he get safe farm? Uh, Havost kind of builds up more typically on the life stealer as uh, not necessarily a raw damage dealer, but he goes for that big tanky style. He wants to frontline. He wants to just be a damage sponge, a raid boss. No one can touch him. And they're going to rely on the co-op for more of that early game damage. So we'll see if the co-op can be successful in lane. Again, Zeus, a lot of kill potential, a lot of farm potential, but Queen of Pain's going to give him a run for his money. Wouldn't be surprised to see a max dagger build and just keep him low, keep him running back and forth to base. I think max dagger might be a little bit pushy, maybe two points, <laughs> maybe even one point. Uh, the reason that max dagger might not be as good in this game, there, there's a time and place for max dagger, but this is probably not it. Um, I think we're looking for a lot of, like, early infest ganks with uh, Havos, and uh, with early infest ganks, you just want as much burst damage as, as possible, so maxing the Scream of Pain is probably a little bit better there. Um, also, I haven't tested this for a while, but I, I do believe you could still infest into the Hawk or the Beastmaster. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you could just uh, do some kind of Korean Air Force drop, I believe, <laughs> and just, just go to work there as well. You know, I haven't seen that mechanic in a while, and I have seen Lightsteel picked up with the Beastmaster, so I'm not quite sure that still works. But yeah, either I'm not way, positive either. They've got like the a... Spirit Breaker as just the ambulance to bring them on in. Your Uber driver has a, uh, arrived, and you can charge on basically any target that reveals themselves. And, you know, on the side of Polarity, they do have a lot of ways to deal with that charge. Uh, Witch, Doctor, Witch Doctor can go for a cheeky cask. They can get some sort of pounce here if Silent is timing things really, really right. Pop into the Shadow Dance. You can go for the Egg onto Lil. So it's not like Polarity are completely defenseless, but... Their lanes are going to really set the pace of the game. If Void can have a su successful off lane, if Slark can have a really nice safe lane, then things are going to be good. But if they get shut down and Slark starves, then there's really no damage coming up for Polarity. Yeah. Up to Zeus, up to Witch Doctor, and, and the Phoenix, which is pretty odd. Normally you don't count on your three squishy ints uh, to be the damage dealer. You look at, you're looking at your safe lane or off lane cores to, to kind of fill that role, but yeah. This is a, kind of a odd draft and an odd pairing of hero. Both of us have been uh, just casting a lot of Chinese Dota, so this is a refreshing kind of change of air, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. We are heading on in, and uh, you know, there's going to be a smoke gank right away just going through as Polarity. They're going to start things off with Vengeance. They want to get this early first blood, and it could be pretty successful if they go for it. They're going to crawl up here. Will they find the Beastmaster? Ghostic sitting up here. Looks like the smokes may end up popping soon. They go on through. Do they have the leap here? Pounce not skilled up, as they're just going to chase them away. So very aggressive rotation. Uh, Polarity exerting their dominance on the dire side of the map. Well... So they sort of exhorted Dominus, they kind of chased him away, but like, you know, they wasted a smoke. If I was the Beastmaster player, I'd be like, nice. They just wasted a smoke. <laughs> Didn't get anything. 
I mean, it's not that expensive, and we actually have seen a lot of teams opt to go for the smoke right out of the base just to get movement speed into the lanes, so it's not super costly there. It costs your supports a couple of pennies, but they'll get it back with one or two last hits. Yeah, it's uh, it's basically if you have a very tough laning stage, you do want those extra smokes to basically you know gank yourself back in the game. Uh, it, it probably won't matter in the grand scheme of things, but there are times where you're like, oh man, we're running out of smokes, you know, 10 minutes into the game. But anyways, looks like the lanes are kind of going into as we were expected. DK Phobos will be in the off lane as his face is void. He doesn't have the the PMS that we we see a lot on the off lane void players. Once you do get the poor man shield, though, you're you're really just like unkillable unless you're getting ganked by like four people. Action to really get started here. The mid lane, we are going to have kind of a duel. Phoenix is going to stick around, soak a little XP, give the Quap a bit of a contest. We are going to see the Quap level up the blink first. So, is that aggressive? Is that defensive? Is that just making sure the Zeus doesn't get that much harass? I think as soon as he saw the Phoenix in the lane, kind of just giving him the beam. There's really no way for him to walk close enough to get off the dagger. He does have access to dagger now. And, well, there's the go. Blink forward dagger. I mean, Zeus is going to be annoyed by this, uh, mostly because he can't actually use his clarity, but he could really just sit far back and uh, just, you know, arc spam away. Um, I am actually surprised the fact that there is no magic stick being picked up by the Queen of Pain. I think she'll get it eventually. I think she may want to get bottle first, but again, that regen will be absurd just because the charges will fill up right away with that arc lightning, with the lightning bolt eventually picked up. Uh, yeah, Zeus is one of the best heroes to pick up the stick against because, you know, he'll fill it up to 17 charges in like a second. Yeah, I think mathematically it works out that by you, it's better off to get stick than bottle. Um, like gold per regen ratio if you're up against Zeus. And uh, right now, there, there's a magic stick being ferried out, and he does have a salve as well. Alright, down bottom, we've got the Beastmaster. He's really not picking up any farm yet. He has been forced back pretty effectively by the supports of Polarity, and, you know, Phoenix, Witch Doctor, super harassy supports. You really can't tangle with these guys in lane. Will Beastmaster have to go rotate to the jungle, or can he stick around for a bit? Yeah, he'll stick around for the bounty rune. He might maybe poke his head mid, maybe go for a stack camp or two, but Beastmaster can recover extremely easily. I think we've seen teams actually jungle Beastmaster as a support and, you know, find level six, probably six minutes in the game. So if he wants to go in the jungle, he can. Um, it's just that I think by, by going into the jungle, he's taking a little bit of Gold Black's room. So he's going to stick it out on the bottom lane a bit and uh, let Gold Black jungle or, in this case, gank. Gold Black is uh, coming around here. Re refreshing the Centaur's uh, life duration, and it looks like smoke runs out, and bank unfortunately will not happen. Iceberg, his uh, senses are absolutely correct here. Yeah, I mean, he's playing this one so safe, and correctly so. If he pushes up just a little bit too far, Quap has that blink, she's got the damage, she's now got the spray of the scream of pain, so you don't want to mess with a Quap. You don't want to give her any sort of advantage going into the lane, because looking at the way that Havos typically, typically builds this lifestealer, Queen of Pain is going to be relied on for the damage for most of this game. Yeah, I mean... I think early on, um, even if your lifestealer isn't building damage, the fact that he's popping out in fest and he's just right-clicking with feast, that's already a sizable amount. But uh, yeah, I think the late game, the Queen of Pain doesn't do too bad in terms of damage output either. Bobos is gonna get a, uh, well, charge, but he easily jumps out. Looks like the chain stun was a little bit off. I think even if they completely chain stun with the first and second centaur, I, I don't think they were gonna get the kill, so... Oh, this mid lane, is where Iceberg. I Iceberg. Probably got jumped and dagger, but yeah. The concern Damn. I have here for, for this lineup is, apart from the Zeus, they oh, can't really lane. kill anybody. Oh, top lane, they're making another go here on Faces Void, and he does have to jump. And again, they're, they're making a lot of these go attempts. They're forced in a TP, but I really don't think they could kill anybody apart from Zeus, and I'm surprised that they are not trying for more on Zeus. Yeah, I think at this point Zeus now picks up his bottle, he's gonna wait till that uh, DPS wears off and now he's just gonna be going back on through bottling up. Queen of Pain is buying a lot of space here, because Iceberg can farm up decently with the Arc Lightning, but he is starting to fall behind in terms of level. Undershock goes in, blinks very aggressive, there's gonna be a charge as well. One, two clicks, might be enough there. One more, should get it done. The slow, steady damage from that dagger will end up deny. burning down the Zeus. The deny! Witch Doctor, what a player there, making sure the first blood is not spilled out just yet. Yeah, so notice how the, the Spear Breaker charged, despite that he will never really make it to the fight in time. It's very important to give uh, vision on the Zeus, especially as he jukes you know, into the trees and whatnot. And uh, that allowed Undershock to get off like an extra auto attack or two, which didn't result in the kill, but you know, at least forced out the TP and the deny, so not too bad. 
Yeah, I mean, I think they can use that charge as reliable vision. And, you know, sometimes we see a Spirit Breaker picked up in a lineup against a Ricky or a Bounty, and there's not a whole lot of core invis heroes here to keep vision on, but nonetheless, it'll help with juke paths and whatnot. Now, down bottom, we've still got the Beastmaster harassed back so heavily, only picked himself up four last hits. Compare that to the Slark's 33, and you've really got a free farming Slark. How much longer can Team Spirit let Silent get huge on the Fish Boy? Again, uh, they probably can't let him get huge, but they actually can't do anything about it. I mean, what's your gank? You know, you charge him, he could easily pounce away, he could dark pack, but well, we're going to see a little bit of gank on the, on the Phoenix. Okay, going back on through, he's getting low. There is going to be Silent doing what he can. There's a pounce here. They locked down Ghostic. They have the Phoenix doing anything he can. He's got the beam in two seconds. One second. Will he get it off? Always want to fly. Joins the party. The nice cast. Bouncing around to fourth. Queen of Pain goes in. The first blood will come out onto Silent. So that Slark finally goes down. They're looking for a double kill. They will get a double kill as Undershock brings back in the Space Cow. And that means Slark, as well as the Witch Doctor, end up going down in a fight that could have gone either way. Beastmaster, lucky to be alive after that one. Yeah, and you can see that the mid lane has really won in favor of the Queen of Pain. Queen of Pain teleported bottom with a level 6 Queen of Pain to change the tide of that fight. Meanwhile, I'm looking at Iceberg, who, if he had level 6, would at least use the ultimate to secure the kill, but he's not even close to 6. So, I think the Queen of Pain essentially 1v1 just outlaned Iceberg pretty hard there. I'm, I'm sure, you know, the Enchantress also came in Down once bottom. in a while and... and made things difficult. Charge is coming through on the bottom here, and Phoenix looks like he will be dead. That one attack took so long to come through, but... And in the end, they trade away the Spirit Breaker for the Phoenix, and Phoenix is so level dependent that even though it's just a support, it's really worthwhile to get the Phoenix down no matter what it costs. Well, maybe not so good if the Slark got the last hit, which is what happened there. Um, I mean, Phoenix, if he's really worried about his levels, he could always just buy Tome of Knowledge. I'm not sure whether that's actually worth it for Team Spirit. I'm going to say no. All right, let's take a look at Havost up here. Has picked up the face boots. Looks like he's going into armlet next. Nothing too surprising. We'll see if Havost wants to go the build. I've seen him go a couple times before, which is the Sanjin Yasha into heart, or if he wants to go for something a little more traditional, like the Echo Saber, uh, even the Desolator. I don't think we're going to see the Desolator because we didn't see that early Blightstone pickup that Life Stealers tend to get. So... You know, it's a little bit up in the air. Life Stealer, one of those very dynamic heroes that's not locked into a certain build. Yeah. I think Kavolski just generally wants to be aggressive, so... Um, it, it surprised me when you told me that he likes to go for a tanky build. I'm sure he's using that tanky build as a, I'm a, I'm a ray boss, let me just run at you kind of stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's Havo style. Once he senses blood, he is just all in, ripping apart everyone in his path. Yeah, one big concern here for Team Spirit is they're supposed to be dominating this early game with the Spirit Breaker and the Enchantress. And yeah, 1 in 3 looks pretty good, but I don't think it's enough. And critically, the Faceless Void is about to hit level 6. And that's when, you know, when you make those tower dives and a, a Void TPs in with a Chronosphere, you're expecting to lose multiple heroes in that tower dive. Also, now Zeus hits level 6, so you, those tower dives even gets more dangerous. Yeah, I'm concerned that I don't think Team Spirit is doing enough. I say that though, here comes a charge on Iceberg, and he should see the charge coming as it's coming through the Matai. Can he react though? He goes in with that lightning bolt, buying himself a little bit of time under shock, spraying him down a bit of damage here. The sunbeam uh, may not end up doing that much. Enchantress has got the little sproinks on him, so it's just going to kind of be a stalemate out. Lots of damage sprayed out, lots of heroes challenging each other, but no one coming to finish the party just yet. Yeah, this basically leaves both the cores free farming, and I think it's. I mean, do you prefer a free farming Slark or a, pre a free farming Life Stealer? Slark is certainly scarier. The thing is that Slark needs kills to really accentuate his farm, whereas Life Stealer can sit back and, you know, get a couple thousand gold and then be online. We'll see if Slark's gonna get any kills spoon fed to him, because he is 0 1 1 right now, which isn't exactly the ideal position for a Slark at almost 10 minutes in. Yeah, he's also gone for the Hand of Midas, so kind of, uh, instead of going for the kills, he's gonna just try to go for his, you know, next two items a little bit quicker. I imagine it's gonna be a Shadow Blade build, although. We might see a revisit of the blink. Undershock, double damage, looking to be very, very aggressive here. So he won't be able to find anybody. At least we'll get some decent damage onto the tower. Witch Doctor coming in, they are going to rotate an Iceberg as well. The cask will go through, won't bounce. And there's no Maledict picked up on the Witch Doctor just yet. He opts to go for two points in the Voodoo Restoration. Now, is that just a little bit too YOLO with his mana? Mm, I think they just want to stack up as much regen as they can. Um, they have the Phoenix region, they have the Voodoo region, and of course Slark has built-in region. I think they just want to be tanky, because if you look at Team Spirit's lineup, if they don't win a fight quick, that's where, you know, Zeus will output a ton of damage, that's where the Slark will build up a ton of stats. 
So I think Polarity just want to stay alive for a lo as long as they can in team fight, and then they they're expected to win these team fights if they go long. Again, that's where Life Slur gets kited for for days. That's where um, Queen of Pain starts to have mana trouble in the later portion of the fights. I think this is the the correct choice here. All right, so again, we are, you know, pretty much done with the laning phase. We've got the mids holding on for stuff. We've got the Slark trying to free farm. But in terms of overall net worth, Team Spirit have gained what they need to. But you mentioned they needed to get a huge momentum swing going for them early. Is this enough? Is this enough for Team Spirit to snowball on and capitalize on? I don't really think so. I think in heroes like Enchantress, as well as uh, Spirit Breaker, they fall pretty hard as supports. You know, going into the mid game, I'd much rather have a big Phoenix ultimate. I'd much rather have the Death Ward and the cast bouncing away. Mid lane looks like we're going to see a Chronos coming in. This should be a very, very easy kill. There's no way Undershock runs away. I also think the ultimate uh, was maybe... He could have held on to that. Maybe <laughs> wait for the blink if they don't get the kill and then ult. But, uh, gotta get that... Gotta get a kill, man. Mid lane. It looks like we're going to see it charging in against Iceberg. I don't think they're going to be able to get this kill, although there is going to be a life stealer inside <laughs> this cute little troll creep. They get the net here, there's going to be some damage coming up. Funny getting kind of low, they bash him up. Iceberg steps between a rock and a hard slave, which Doctor tries to cast, tries to buy some time. Funny actually may end up burning down to the Phoenix. There is going to be a shout on the back left. Always want to fly, getting nuked down as life stealer picks himself up another kill, and that's going to be the void. Zoned back, doesn't have a corner to go back in. There's going to be a swoop. It could have stabbed coming on through, and there's going to be a pounce here. Gold Black will give his life. They pop out the egg. Very heavy commit there from the Phoenix. They are able to get something in return. It's going to be a two for two overall in the end that will still heavily favor Team Spirit. Yeah, I mean, losing two support for a Zeus. And again, Zeus, I keep going back to this. He's the most important hero. He needs to get good farm. And he's the second highest net worth for his team, but not looking really good for Zeus. If Zeus starts to die in this stage of the game, he will just keep dying. You really want that one early defensive item, whether it's Aether Lens giving you more range, or whether it's Yule Scepter to, well, you know, send yourself or enemy up in the air, or just a support staff. You want at least one or two, one of those items, uh, before you start massively feeding. And it's looking like he's uh, on track for feeding, I guess. But it depends on how hard they want to go on him. And uh, speaking of that, undershock, you know, smoked up, going for Zeus. Yeah, Iceberg just has to sit there and take it. There's nothing he can do, and Havost, he's now sitting on a decent chunk of pennies. He is going to be flying himself in the Blightstone, so it looks like he will go for the Desolator after all. He's going to be hitting an earlier power spike than usual, and, you know, with the Queen of Pain coming in, she hasn't had that much mana problem, so she should be able to get uh, a bunch of stuff done now in this mid-game peak. Yeah, it looks like she's going to be going for Orchid, which uh, makes a complete uh, amount of sense, especially if you could Orchid the Faces Void before the Chrono comes out, or just Zeus, or even the Phoenix, um, or the Slark, you know, perfect pickup here. Slark checking out his gold, he's got 9, uh, 1,000 in the bank. Shadow Blade, again, is, is the go-to item, but we'll see. We'll see what styling goes for. Yeah, I mean, we have seen Slark's you know, if they're kind of feeling behind, if they definitely need that jump, go for something like a Blink Dagger, but I think there's just a little too much DOT on Spirit to get away with that successfully, and, you know, Slark really needs to start catching himself up, he's 0-1-2, and 2. he's got a huge chunk of last hits, he's now picked up his 100th, and he is top of the net worth chart, but he's gonna be carrying his team on his shoulders, I mean, you can't rely on Faceless Void to put out that much damage, so Slark's really the only kind of back lines, the rest of his team can start the fight off for him, but he needs to be able to go through and finish off the kills. Yeah, I think Slark's job in this game is mostly just to kind of attack him from the back line, because in the front, you're expecting your Void to chrono as many people as possible. So you're looking to pick off heroes like Enchantress, maybe the Beastmaster, if he's selling, uh, sending relatively far back. And I think for that, you want a Shadow Blade uh, and then a Silver Edge to break the Untouchable. Because if you're trying to go on Enchantress and there's Untouchable on and you can't actually get the kill, then that gets pretty awkward for you. And yeah, he, he will start things off by picking up a Claymore. All right, yeah, I think that's the right build. He's got to be spooky, he's got to be sneaky, and they are going to see Funic uh, taking a note from Slark's book and being kind of spooky here, looking for maybe some sort of charge. There is going to be Iceberg picking up an arcane rune, so, I mean, Zeus, he's got a lot to work with. There's going to be a charge on Always Want to Fly. They go through, they get the open wounds. He's bashed up onto the cliff, just beep bopped around, and it looks like he will end up going down in the end. So Havost and Funic proving to be uh, the good old Navi duo rotating around and picking up some kills for Spirit. Yeah, the kill looked nice, but uh, it's all set up by the support that warded here. Uh, without that vision, it would not have gotten off the charge. So oh, very silent. nice defense fly. Oh. He could just pounce time. on Funic. Nope. I think. <laughs> the cow <laughs> tried to juke the Sunray and just like took a whole bunch <laughs> of damage. 
Yeah, that was uh, a bit quirky there. As Lark does pick himself up a bit of farm. Uh, he's not going to be that far off from his Shadow Blade. Just needs about a thousand more gold. Should be a couple more minutes in the jungle, a couple more minutes with his Midas, and he'll be online. Is that Shadow Blade the item he needs to really start going here? Is that going to be the start of the snowball? For who? Sark. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, he's already got the Claymore, right? So it's pretty much Shadow Blade or, or Bust. Yeah, I just wonder if that's going to be the raw damage that he needs. Obviously, the Silver Edge will help just cut down the Enchantress like the cute little Bampy she is. But, you know, you kind of want him to go for some survivability. I think he he just gets picked off too quickly in these fights. If Team Spirit get the opportunity to focus the Slark, then he's out of there. I mean, Slark, the only way he survives in fights is just not being, you know, initiated upon. Just uh, make sure that you're, you're on the aggression. It, I don't think it matters, let's say if Slark randomly gets a Vanguard. If he gets focused, he gets focused and he still dies. Your items won't really help you. You just have to make sure that you're in the correct position at the correct times. And I think Shadow Blade helps uh, for the most part, and he does pick it up. Uh, and we do see Havolz on the bottom. He, he infested into the Queen of Pain. And then got brought to bottom and go for ganks. We're gonna see uh, Havol slowly slow down in terms of his farm, and that's unfortunately the downside of playing a core lifestyle like this. A lot of times you kind of hide into your your friends. You know, if you find a gank's great. If you don't, then you're losing out on farm time. That's, that's kind of the the thing that a lot of lifestyle players have to balance out. All right, so Havost is going to be going for the Sanj and Yasha, uh, and I definitely like this a lot. I think if he does go into that heart, he can be a big frontliner, and that's something that Team Spirit are missing at this point. They need someone to just go in and soak all the damage that Polarity can put out. There's going to be a smoke here from Polarity. They're looking around. They do have that leap into Chrono, and that's going to be big if they follow it up with an egg. There's so much damage. They've got their full combo online. Can they find the jump point here? The Hawk goes through, won't scout out anything again because of that smoke. Who's going to be the first one to walk into this trap? Well... Enchantress seems like it, and you don't really want to jump on Enchantress silently coming and scouting things out, Havos running far away, and this could be a two-man chrono. In fact, a two-man chrono is going to go on the back line to kill two in the front. They're looking for two in the back here. Great initiation coming up on the faces board. Goldback trying to survive, but you ain't surviving from Zeus. Well, I say that she survives a little bit longer. Meanwhile, silent on the back line, going to work here, chomping down these supports. Havos, well, there's an egg being popped out here. Undershock needs to just run. Havos can armor talk a little bit more, but we'll need to do so right now. It's going to cast bounce between two heroes from both is gonna be dead on the shock the only soul survivor here well you know we keep asking whether the small lead that they had was enough and we get a very defined <laughs> no yeah, I mean, that was a really, really big fight for Polarity. They kind of just exert the fact that, you know what, laning stage is over. We can five, man. We can get those fights. Again, the support around the Corona was huge, and that's going to be over a 2k gold swing, almost a 3,500 XP swing, and that's going to dip things back in Polarity's favor. There is going to be a charge. They will get the Phoenix as a consolation prize, but certainly not worth dropping everyone but the Bambi. Yeah, they need to get a little bit more than the Phoenix. Perhaps tier 1 tower push will be a sizable push uh, afterwards. Or maybe they even go for Roshan. They know that Chronosphere as well as uh, the Dundegrath's Wrath will be down for a while. So this is their window of opportunity to do something. And uh, we do see the Beastmaster ping the Roshan pit. They need to essentially get the Roche and probably just throw it on the Queen of Pain or, or the Life Slayer and make sure that they didn't lose that fight for nothing. All right, well, there's going to be a Roshan coming up from Spirit, and I like this a lot. Like you mentioned, make sure they at least get something on the back of that terrible, terrible team fight. But that does give Polarity more room to farm up. They're not feeling that spooked and silent going through. He's got almost 3k gold here sitting on the back, so he's going to go finish up that Silver Edge. Now, what's he doing next? Could it be a BKB? Could it be an Echo Saber? Now, he's going to get bashed up here, immediately pops into the LT. He's TPing out. Do they have anything to break it? Nah, they just have to let him go. Yep. Charge was already used. Charge is the only way that could stun through uh, invisibility. Uh, what is he gonna go next? I like to just upgrade to finish uh, the Silver Edge. Just He's to get got a it on the courier. Okay, great. Um, and then that's where you start to look for things like Echo Saber. You could, if you want just raw stats, you can go for I have Scotty. That, that's not too bad. Um, SMY, you could go back for that as well. I think it just comes down to player preference. I, I think Echo Saber by far is the most common follow up um, after this. All right, yeah, speaking of uh, Sanjin Yasha, we've got the Life Stealer almost finished it up, needs about 200 more golds, and that's going to be Havost able to just go in and just start whipping you apart. And now, looking at the damage on Team Spirit, it seems like it's coming from a lot of different sources, where on Polarity, the real damage is only coming off of the Slart. How's that power balance going to come to fruition in these fights? Well, I think Zeus and Phoenix, as well as Witch Doctor, carries a bit as well, so I don't think it's as lopsided as you mind. Um, but yeah, Slark... 
he, he doesn't deal a ton of burst damage like Azusa would, but he kind of sticks on you and does a lot of incremental damage as his fight drags on. Um, I think it's okay. I think both teams are quote unquote happy where they are. I'm sure that Team Spirit wouldn't be, uh, you know, maybe not not that happy because they lost the last team fight. But I think they they still feel like they could win this game, especially off the back of that HS pickup. And you do see that polarity as soon as their ultimate are back up, they're they're starting to group up and, and look for a team fight. And that team fight might happen here on the bottom lane. Yeah, it looks like uh, Polarity are going to TP back from this. They don't want to just completely ignore the fact that Team Spirit are pushing because they can push relatively quickly and these guys are yucky to go up against on the high ground. We'll see how the fight comes out. They do have the Chrono at the ready. They've got the full combo there with the Egg and everything else. The Death Ward too. They're smoked up. Can they find the push here? It looks like everyone is backing off. Oh, Silent should be deep up and on in as Funix. Oh, he did not want to reveal there. He will get burned down. There's nothing they can do on the back lines. There will be the Death Ward dropped. Not really catching out a whole lot there. Can Lil go into the Egg? Icarus dive around. There's going to be the Aegis popped in the Queen of Pain. Bobos is still looking, he's still holding the Chrono here. He's gonna cast that, but that's not good anyone except for Undershot coming out of the Aegis. But oh, there's gonna be a roar in the back lines. The Sunray will keep everyone alive. So it looks like kind of a whiffed Chrono will secure a kill after all. Now Havost is able to TP out. They're not gonna get the big meaty kill that they wanted on the back line, so they will pick off the deer. There's a TP out from Ghostic, so it's gonna be two surviving, two leave the fight, and they end up dropping the Zeus, so it's not gonna be a huge one sided fight. I think that's pretty one-sided. I mean, they also lost to Aegis on top of that, right? So Team Spirit essentially gave away four kills. They killed a Zeus and maybe a Witch Doctor, right? I just don't think that's enough. Um, they, they dropped the Sentry and they saw the Slar coming in. Uh, looks like we missed the kill. My, my bad, I missed the kill in the mid lane. Um, I mean, they saw the Slark coming in, they're like, okay, maybe we could initiate and, and blow up the Slark. And that comes into the problem with this Team Spirit lineup. How do you lock down a Slark? I think the best way that they can is maybe blink with the Beastmaster and roar and pray to god that he didn't press death pack. Because if that roar gets death packed, like, they just don't have any ways to deal with him. I mean, you could orchid him as well, but the Queen Pain I don't think was in, in range to do so. So that Slark just basically went unchecked. Half the team was running away from the Slark, half the team was initiating in, and that really uh, went poorly. Again, a great Chronosphere setting up the egg, uh, chronoing two heroes that were alive and, and a Queen of Pain that was coming back to alive, and that just turned into a lopsided team fight. And that's the weakness of this Team Spirit lineup, a lineup that just runs at you. It's very predictable, you know how the fight, for the most part, is going to go. And as long as the Chronosphere don't whiff completely, it, it should just make the fight fairly easy for Polarity. We'll have to see moving forward as slowly but surely Team Spirit are rotating around, picking off these towers. It's the final tier one going to be going down in this top lane. And, you know, Team Spirit can get a lot done with map advantage. You've got Spirit Breaker walking around, you've got Havost in the jungle, you've got Beastmaster in the jungle, and he's able to push very, very quickly now. He has those Necro 3s. So I think you're underestimating Spirit just a little bit. Silent, he's here. He's Shadow Bladed up, or rather Silver Edged up. He's going to go through immediately picking off Gold Black. The heal, not enough to keep Bambi alive, and now there's Undershot going to be sitting there. The Death Ward on the back lines. There's going to be a shout holding DK Fubbles in place, but there's still enough damage to finish off uh, whoever they need to from under the Chrono. And now Lightsteamer does get the kill back on the Zeus. And Silent, he's Silent up. He can't go back on through. And Funic sitting here. There's going to be an egg. Can Spear Breaker get out? He's got no charge. Leap back in. One hit. Will finish off the space cow in the boat. He's going to get stunned up from the egg. He's sitting there. He's taking the sunray right to the back and will end up burning out in the river ghost stick just juking around trying to save his life one more hit from silent will finish the job you've got a pounce coming up but not even needed there as slark is able to run and catch up to him so in the end it's going to be dropping the zeus dropping a couple ulties for four heroes killed off yeah i think that was a really bad miscommunication coming up from team spirit i think queen of pain and the Beastmaster was trying to escape from from the fight and then you had got the spirit breaker and the life star charging in so Basically, Team Spirit just divided themselves in that team fight, and well, again, the end result is not pretty. And you can make you, you could say that they're you know making poor plays, but this particular lineup, they just have to fight the way they are. Like you kind of just have to run in and throw your lives uh, and for kills, because that's that's how they fight, right? Like there's there's no big AOE team fight apart from the Queen of Pain. There's no you know elegant ganks until I guess uh, the Beastmaster gets a blink dagger. So they kind of just have to run at them and. So far, these run at them strategy is, well, you say that, you say I'm underestimating them, but I don't think I am. I, I think they're just making uh, poor plays here and there, and they're getting punished pretty hard. 
Yeah, I, th I think we'll have to see. I don't think we can underestimate Havost on this life stealer. Again, once he smells out that blood, he will chase you down to the end of the earth. And, and now that he has picked up that Sanjin Yasha, he's going to be picking up what looks to be a desolator. He's going to be cleaning up fairly quickly, just slicing through the armor on Polarity Slark. You know, he's got that 18 base armor. It's not going to mean a whole lot once you've got that uh, desolator aura coming out. Yeah, uh, the, I think the bigger problem is whether he could stick on people, which Undershock's going to definitely help him in that regard. If Undershock could blink into the middle of the fight, and provided they don't get Chrono, I, I think th there's a lot of hoops that he needs to jump through, but yes, if he could jump through those hoops, he will shred people apart. Um, Undershock is getting relatively farmed as well. We, we saw in the previous team fight, he was able to survive uh, being chrono and being focused by like three or four heroes and blink away. So, if Undershock could kind of maintain his composure and survive in these team fights, they may they may have a shot. But um, as I'm counting right now, Polarity has won three team fights in a row. Uh, one before the Roshan, one after the Roshan with the Aegis uh, on the Queen of Pain, and one just now. So, I think if you're a Polarity fan, you should be fairly happy how this game's going. <laughs> Oh, Funnick, he's just got to sit here. There's only so much lockdown. Oh. He won't be able to go back through, but Zeus, oh, he hits R, and he secures a kill. There you go. And uh, you talked about how Team Spirit, once the map is wide open up, they have heroes like Queen of Pain, the Infest, Life Slur, as well as the Beastmaster. They could, you know, walk around and do a lot. Well, Silent on the Slar could do the, exactly the same, and he doesn't really care at all, you know, whether where you are, whether you're farming. I mean, a jungle in the lane, he will hunt you down. So, on that regard, I'm, I'm fairly uh, scared for Team Spirit. Yeah, it seems like Polarity, they started things off with an aggressive smoke gank right at the beginning, and they're still claiming this dire territory for their own. Uh, the thing about Silent right now is he doesn't have any TPs, so if he, for some reason, has the Shadow Dance, if it expires, he's got no way to get out of a sticky situation. So, he has to be cognizant of that, the fact that he's so reliant on this team to go follow up on this damage, because he can't just keep jumping into YOLO situations like this. There will be a TP down bottom here as Iceberg wants to go through, wants to deny the tower to the Siege Creep, but the Siege Creep, he gets it! Oh man, that gold's gonna feel nice for spirit. Zeus, Zeus base damage. I think the reason that Silent is uh, playing so cocky, like you know he's between towers and whatnot, he understands that the only spell that he really needs to dodge is a like a charge or a nether strike. Oh he might need to dodge this but he does have the man to do so but like you said he's uh maybe a little bit too deep. He's trying to run away the ultimate has ran out. He jumps away again very low in the mana and I guess he's unpunished and that's again goes back to what I pointed out earlier. How do you lock down uh, you just need to blink on Beastmaster. Like he, he needs to get on farming because without it, they really cannot kill the Slark. Yeah, he went for full Necro 3s before picking up the Blink. Sometimes you see the Necro 1 into Blink, sometimes you see Necro 2 into Blink, and he really wants that push power, but it's it's very greedy, and we're seeing now that that Blink is costing him. He really has to get in, get close, and get off that Primal Roar as soon as possible. I, I definitely do agree with the Necro 3 first, because the stats to give you is great, the push like you mentioned, and just just the fact that it just makes team fight a little bit easier, you could chase down supports. Um, I just think that uh, instead of going for fights as uh, often as they have, maybe just focus a little bit more on oh. the outer tower objectives. Go Black! No! And he did. <laughs> I mean, you can see tried to go for the Stroinks there, but Silent, just a stone-cold poacher going in, and Enchantress, that's gonna be the fifth time she's died. I believe most of those are by the hand of the Slark. And I think she's gonna die a handful more times before this game ends. Unfortunately for her, there is Zeus, there's Slark with uh, Silver Edge that breaks her untouchable, and uh, yeah, Basher is coming up next here for Silent. Yeah, and that can easily be leveled up in, into an Abyssal Blade relatively soon, and that's going to be some fantastic lockdown. You've got slippery heroes like the Spirit Breaker, like the Quap. Uh, eventually, when the Beastmaster gets Blink, just go in, pop Abyssal, and they are three shots to dead. Yeah. Uh, traditionally, I would say, hey, you have a Slark lineup, you don't push high ground very well, but Team Spirit don't have the best counter push. In fact, like Slark just walks up to the high ground. <laughs> Who's actually stopping him? You don't have like a Lina Dragon Slave, you don't have a Luminates from a Keeper of Light. You know, that's that's the downside of having supports like Enchantress and, and Spirit Breaker. They pay, they play so poorly from behind. Oh, looks like Slark will go through, take this tier two tower. There's going to be the uh, Veil on the Zeus, just keeping everyone at bay. They don't want to deal with the amplified magic damage of the Zeus. Now, Silent might have bitten off more than he can chew. He has to run oh. back. There's going to be a charge coming back on through, but it is canceled. As Polarity, they've got the resources to deal with an aggressive Spirit Breaker. Now, Iceberg going back in, just sending Havos back to base. This is not the place you want to see a lifestyle lineup. You want to see them farming. There's going to be a roar fallout when 
you know, no real follow up. The charge comes back on through, and there is going to be Undershock Zone, but the BKB wants to unload the ulti. We're going to get blasted down. We'll get the ulti out, take out the Witch Doctor, but that's not the trade they wanted. Now, Havos, he's fighting, he's stuck in the chrono. There's going to be Silent wailing away onto the life. So their immediate buyback, they're focusing on the rack now. The Phoenix Egg will end up going through, gets the stun onto Gold Black. Gold Black sitting there. Can the deer get away? Gonna be running fast, silent, slowed up by those open wounds, and oh man, Zeus showing no remorse, just ripping apart Enchantress with that lightning bolt and the veil. And this is at least a set of racks at 30 minutes in. Do you think it's full GG? It is. Yeah, it is. Wow. Yeah, it is. I mean, when you lose three team fights in a row, I don't know. I, I think it just <laughs> goes back to the draft. They, they needed to win the early game much harder than they did. Um, there was repeated ganks on the faces void up top, and none of them was successful. I think if you're gonna just make YOLO dive ganks, it should be on the Zeus, because honestly, he's the only one you could really, really kill. And we really haven't even seen the Witch Doctor or the Phoenix do, like, big damage output ultimates. It's just like, they kind of just stood there, did their thing. Um, I, I just think that this Go Black lineup needed to go hard.